There was an opinion piece that uh, Phil Spencer's legacy is going to be the guy who killed Xbox. So this is VGC opinions from Nathan Brown. Phil Spencer, long cast as Xbox savior, may be remembered as the man who killed it. Hit points. Now that all his big bets have failed, Spencer is turning to corrective measures. Measures from Nathan Brown. All of his big bets have failed. So he wasn't responsible for the Xbox One launch. I would say the Xbox One X was successful. It definitely was a more powerful box. There were some great looking games on it. Once it was out there and people were playing it, uh, it did have a noticeable impact on performance. It was much better than the PlayStation 4 Pro at the time. And it's one of the first videos I did on this channel, actually. I did the unboxing of the Xbox uh, One X in my old apartment. And I was I was pretty hyped about it. So I, I was pretty happy with it about at that time. And it was at that time when Game Pass was starting to become a thing and they had games like... Uh, the original Mass Effect was part of Game Pass via the, the EA collaboration, and they had some enhancements that were made to old games, even at that time, including the original Mass Effect that made it function better than it did uh, previously. And they've continued to support a lot of old games. Like if you pop in Fa uh, Fallout 3, there's a ton of uh, upscaling going on there that just looks excellent. And then the Xbox Series X, it is a great piece of hardware. They had a whole year miss in terms of releases. This is one of their strongest years out the gate. Uh, Halo Infinite came out and it's done well, but it hasn't you know, captured the audience in the way that I think anybody had hoped, especially Halo fans like myself. I've, I have 500 hours in Halo Infinite. I played a lot. I played all the seasons. I've been playing a lot right now because it's actually in a really good place right now, but it could be too little too late. But let's hear from uh, Nathan Brown continuing on about how he feels it's not like working out. Hit Points is a free newsletter from former Edge editor Nathan Brown delivering insight and commentary on the games industry. Below is a piece syndicated from Hit Points, but if you want to, you should head over and subscribe to the newsletter. Okay, so check out Hit Points if you're into stuff like this. Phil Spencer spoke to the press at GDC last week, offering some context slash spin on Microsoft's recent maneuvers while dropping a few now customary hints about the Xbox division's future plans. I take one issue with this. I am no longer sure Xbox has much of a future to speak of. Moreover, I think Phil Spencer for so long cast as Xbox savior um, may ultimately be remembered as the man who killed it. Speaking to Polygon, which was chopped, which has chopped the interview up into multiple pieces in the classic early 2010 style. Spencer lamented that the games industry simply isn't growing enough, explaining that all of Microsoft's recent moves, the act, Acquisition, Blizzard, Concessions. Is this supposed to say Activision? Anyway. The decision to take Xbox exclusive to PlayStation 5 and our Switch, the layoffs, have been designed to counter his unavoidable, irrefutable truth. Without new customers, Spencer says, everybody else's customers is your success state. You can't succeed unless you draw in customers from other publishers and other platforms. And because you're not finding new customers with the games that you're building, everybody's kind of fighting over the same size pie. This is really interesting insight from, uh, who is this, Nathan? Nathan Brown. I find it odd that he was critical. This one threw me off a little bit, just reading it. But it sounds like he was critical of, of Polygon for breaking up the interview. Like there, there were different topics and I thought it was good. I, I, I thought that was a little weird from Nathan that he's like criticizing that it was broken up and that Xbox made concessions. Did they really make concessions in the Activision Blizzard thing at the end of the day? Anyway, let's continue on because he, he's getting to his point, but I don't feel like he's, he's made it yet. When you have an industry that is projected to be smaller next year in terms of players and dollars, and you get a lot of publicly traded companies that are in the industry that have to show their investors growth, because why else does somebody own a share of someone's stock if it's not going to grow? The side of the business that then gets scrutinized is the cost side, because if you're not going to grow the revenue side, then the cost side becomes challenged. Now look, Spencer is right to a degree, 
end, if this were coming from a punter, a rank and file developer at a random game studio or a mostly successful newsletter idiot, it would be fair comment. But Phil, mate, I'm sorry to point this out to you, but you're the head of Xbox. I'm not sure you get to pin all this on the macroeconomic this and that, you know. You have had, I think it's fair to say, a degree of agency in all of this. Indeed, there are maybe half a dozen people with the power to actually change the shape of the games industry. And for the last 10 years, you have been one of them. I do not see much point in dwelling on how we got here because I think it is quite obvious to us all what's gone wrong. All of Spencer's big bets, the pivot to subscriptions, the variable hardware skews, the spending spree of studio acquisitions were contingent on Xbox not just being, to borrow the Xbox tagline, the best place to play, but the best place to play the best games. If there's one lesson we can take from the Spencer era, it's that you can act all the disruptive change you like, but you cannot disprove the industry's oldest truth. Great games sell consoles. A hundred billion dollars later, Xbox still doesn't have them. If anything, I would argue its first party output has got worse since the shopping spree began and its struggles are as such no surprise at all. I got to be honest, y'all. I don't think Nathan said anything too crazy in his introductory statements. I do think Xbox needs to get on the right track with their game releases. And it's taken them a long time to get there. Sea of Thieves is very successful, though. Grounded is very successful, though. Uh, Halo Infinite has continued to do well even though a lot of people have written that game off. I think if you're continuing to write that game off, uh, I, I think you're incorrect. But uh, just to be respectful about it. And I, I don't think that he's failed. For all of his failures, according to most people, everything that he has done has been about the player. We have more access to more games at a lower price point. They have utilize their game pass growth to sort of force playstation to make positive changes for their player base uh their their cross-generational strategy i believe has been very positive for the consumer so i i think he's done a lot of good for the industry even being in third place because when xbox shakes things up a little bit it makes sony playstation take notice because they need to have an answer to what xbox does and that's why xbox is so important to the overall ecosystem of gaming even nintendo has gotten in on the subscription market because of what xbox has done and what playstation has done like these decisions that he has made have forced the other companies to take a look at where their shortcomings were and improve them so i would argue he's done a lot of good even from the third place market and i think he's on the precipice of making massive sweeping changes to the xbox brand for the better thank you aries for becoming a member i see that console wars are dead people play on the go more and more look at switch handheld is where it's at people don't care how they play or what system he's absolutely right aries is absolutely correct in that assumption and i do agree with him absolutely kenneth says uh you think abk deal was for gamers what a delusional take Wait until all those games come to Game Pass. I'm saying it will have a positive impact for gamers in the long run. All those Bethesda games are now available on Game Pass. It, it's a lower barrier to entry. It's for profit, make no mistake. But the overall situation that's going to happen because of it, in my opinion, is that gamers are going to have more options in terms of where they play or where they spend their money. Spencer spent part of his Polygon interview musing airily about a dedicated Xbox handheld, which I'm sure seems like a no-brainer in a world where Steam Deck exists, but I imagine it will be an alarging, alarming prospect for a development community that is slowly cottoning onto the fact that making games for Xbox is too much of a faff given the tepid reviews on offer. I mean, they if they're releasing it on the Steam Deck, I don't know why it would be problematic to release it on an Xbox handheld because Steam Deck independently verifies that those games well and run well enough. I believe that's how the, the verification process works. And you can run a lot of those games anyway if they're not verified. 
for for your own amusement. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me why he would say that, oh, it's going to be too hard for developers to release on a handheld. I, I think he could have supported that argument better. I don't really understand that one. And I just realized this text is super small for you. GI Biz Chris Dring returned from GDC with tales of publishers questioning their future support of a platform that bakes in so much risk, a dominant subscription service cannibalizing game sales, the need to ensure parity across Series S and X, further increasing sky-high development costs. This is an Xbox's fault. And offers such a small audience in return. Now you want a handheld version as, as well? Best of luck with that. I feel like Nathan, like Steam exists, right? Like people realize Steam exists. So if you have Steam on a Windows OS powered handheld device or Epic Game Store, which is basically confirmed, uh, assuming this thing is, it's like, it seems like Phil is saying it's happening. So I'm assuming it is. Uh, if you have those on there, it's just about launching a different app. So I don't think it's about forcing anybody to do it. I think there would be very little in terms of forcing the devs to add any additional platforms. I do agree with the, the question about the Series S, though. And I talked about that on the previous stream. I wonder where that is going. Uh, Confused Risen says Activision games coming to Game Pass will create more competition and competition is good. Like... Who else could Microsoft, Sony ate all the small guys up? Yeah, like Sony was buying who they could buy. So Microsoft's like, okay, like uh, we lost Insomniac. We need to start making some moves here. We're done. And they did. And they bought the big boys. And then everybody started freaking out. He continues. Now that all his big bets have failed, how have they failed? I mean, they're still profitable. They haven't taken second. Basically, it's Xbox and PlayStation. Those are who the two that are competing. We know Nintendo's in there. No one's going to touch Nintendo. PlayStation's not coming anywhere near Nintendo in the, in the next few years. I don't know that we can say they failed, but I'll, I'll go with Nathan on it, I guess. Now that all his big bets have failed, Spencer is turning to corrective measures, short-term fixes that might juice the numbers in the next couple of P&Ls, but seem destined to further weaken the Xbox ecosystem down the line. Bringing the likes of the Epic Game Store and its.io to Xbox consoles will confuse the value proposition, give users more way to give money to people that aren't Microsoft and do nothing to transform Xbox's fortunes. That is a good point. That will be a little bit of money for Xbox, but it will give people more options on this new Xbox platform being pitched, meaning that money is gonna to go to Epic Game Store, it's gonna to go to its.io, Hopefully, I didn't see the Steam was confirmed. If somebody saw that, just let me know in chat really quick. But um, I, he does make a good point there. I do think that there has to be a concern about the revenue share with Steam, the revenue share with Epic Game Store. How is that going to work? Epic Game Store hasn't been a huge success to date. They're trying to get people to launch there first because then you don't have to pay your development costs. So it, it is definitely an interesting point that he brings up here. So this, I'm going to give him this one. I think this is a good thing to highlight. I don't think that Xbox has failed when, when they're dead, then they failed until then. I just see good value propositions for customers. And I don't really care how, if Xbox like is having trouble making a billion, like if they only make a hundred million <laughs> instead of a billion, at least they're profitable and, and and gamers are seem to be getting mostly good things out of the situation right i would love to have my itch library on a console don't get me wrong but if spencer thinks that's going to move the needle in any meaningful way then i have some magic beans to sell him and if he thinks that this is a two-way street the first step on a journey that ends with game pass on playstation 5 switch and steam then he has truly lost the plot the writer says he actually likes the idea. So I think he's coming. He's He seems to be like, I like everything Xbox has done, but they've failed in their business goals of making a ton of money, right? And I think that's what he's getting at. But even he admits that he likes this idea of having his itch library on a console. So they're... <laughs> 
if even this extremely negative article is saying they're on to something, then that seems like they're on to something to me. Taking former exclusives to rival platforms is yet more short-term thinking. Sure, it may pump the numbers a bit, but each new port is one less reason for a potential new customer to buy an Xbox and one more reason for Xbox owners to switch sides and abandon the platform for good. Once again, I cannot see a way in which this ends with Xbox as we know it today, at least getting stronger. The same argument was made when Xbox started doing day and date on PC. So this is one I actually disagree with a lot. The strategy is they release Xbox games on PlayStation, PlayStation players play it and Nintendo players play it. And then when the next device comes out, which is rumored to be a handheld and a, the most powerful console they've ever made, like they say every time, they will purchase that thing because all those games are available as part of that ecosystem and it's a way to get them in the door. That's what I see Xbox trying to do here. I don't think this has anything to do with the FTC or anything like that. So. I disagree with this point. Agreed with some of the stuff he said in the private paragraph, not with this one as much. That is my immediate reaction to it. Like, the same argument could be made for PlayStation. Oh, PlayStation's releasing games on PC now. That's just one less reason to own a PlayStation 5. Uh, it's more of an industry problem than anything, right? So, games are more expensive than ever to make super duper expensive they need to release on more platforms to be successful look at destiny 2 it had a 45 percent revenue miss and it's on three different platforms like something's out of whack with the budgeting i don't think that's particularly an xbox issue that is an industry issue that should be addressed so that particular paragraph i i don't necessarily agree with i think this is a great article by the way i love reading stuff like this where somebody like has such a wildly different opinion on what's happening than I do. And I don't feel like it's inflammatory. I don't know what the, the right thing is. I don't agree with him, but I appreciate that he's actually thought about this and written it out a bit. Um, let us assume charitably that Sea of Thieves sells 5 million copies at $40 a pop when it launches on PS5 next month. It was, it's still the top selling. It's still one of the top selling games. Still one of the top selling games. Let us even more charitably pretend that means $200 million in revenue for Microsoft, ignoring distribution and marketing, Sony's platform cut, and the cost of making the port in the first place. Last quarter, $200 million would have increased Microsoft's revenue by about 0.3%. That is merely a rounding error for a company of that size. And where the health of its gaming division is concerned, it is little more than a sticking plaster. It's $200 million from a game that has been out for several years. How is that bad? Yes, it's 0.3% of Microsoft's... It's $200 million for, an, for a six-year-old game. Sorry. Uh, maybe you don't switch to the next Xbox console everybody still thinks about the console market and that's the weird thing right it's not the console market isn't growing so anybody in chat arguing about the console you know what console sold the best ever the playstation 2 nothing has beat the playstation 2 there's a there's a post today where it, it talks about how it, jim ryan said it actually sold 160 million units so now the Nintendo Switch doesn't even have a chance to reach it. The consoles don't matter. The industry needs to evolve with their distribution strategy. And anytime I see these arguments, it's very strange to me because it's not 1992 anymore. It's not 20 years ago when we had these boxes that were necessary to run these games on locked ecosystems. Look at how well the Steam Deck has done for Steam. The Steam platform is successful and the Steam Deck is successful because of their library. Most of their money is coming from the, the game library, their platform, Steam, right? So I don't see how 200, a, 
I really don't get that one. I think that one's a little crazy. Somebody asked me a question in chat actually uh, a little bit ago. This take from Destin is what I think as so wrong. Why would you switch from PlayStation? Because a cool new handheld comes out and you can have all of the games that you love, including the sequel to Hi-Fi Rush there first for a year. It's the same reason like, why would you buy a PlayStation if you know all the games are coming to PC? It's the exact same argument. Why can't you take the same lens that you're focusing on Xbox and apply it to PlayStation? Because the exact same strategies are being implemented at PlayStation. They've slashed their trajectory for console sales. They've slashed it from 25 to 21 million. Somebody want to do the math real quick on what a uh, 4 million console sale cost reduction or revenue reduction would be? And how many games that they're not going to be able to sell that they imagined that they would have been selling to those 4 million customers? It's a lot. Why is Hiroki Totoki going so aggressive with the PC release strategy? The, the fact that it's not seen, I just don't get it. And the, the strategy that I think Phil is, that I think he's implementing, I'm not saying he is, is that he releases these year old or six year old games in Sea of Thieves or grounded as even older on these other platforms. And maybe like 1% of those, what are, how many, what was his math here? 5 million. What's 1% of 5 million? You get a few more users in PlayStation. Like you can't think about this like a year later. You have to think what is Xbox's vision over 10 years? These companies plan 10 years out and they try and make trajectories for that. They're not, of course they're looking at the day to day, but they're also looking further out. Yeah, PlayStation games do sell very well, Tubok 1980, not good enough for Hiroki Totoki or PlayStation executive leadership. They don't. They're spending $300 million on their games right now. They, and we know because of all those documents that leaked, unfortunately, some of them are not initially launching as profitable, like they're long tail profits. Let's finish out this article. I do like this article a lot though. And I, I really respect the writer for writing it because they have probably been being beat up for like several days. I don't agree with most of it, but it's always good to have people that challenge our blind spots and have these conversations with, right? To be clear, I feel bad for Spencer. He seems a decent sort. I think he's coming to this with the best of intentions and in a parallel universe where every horse he backed romped home, he would be credited with transforming and perhaps even saving the games industry. In another, where instead of spending 70 billion on, so it's all about the 70 billion thing. Where was the criticisms when Sony bought all the companies that they bought? Nobody cared. But like Xbox starts spending lots of money because they have lots of money and it matters. You, you, I, do you really think that if PlayStation could have bought Activision that they would not have bought Activision? They absolutely would have. They absolutely would have bought Activision. If that landed at their front door, they would have been fighting for it. They probably tried to. They're, they're not going to be like, oh, well, you know, we really want to foster our relationship with Activision. The spin would be, well, we've had all of these, you know, exclusive partnerships with PlayStation for so long. And, you know, we've been working together so closely. The same thing, the same sort of narrative that Xbox did with the Bethesda thing, by the way. That's exactly what Sony would have done. So this idea that PlayStation wouldn't have bought Activision if, if they could have, it's not true. Microsoft had a ton of money. Activision came to them at the right time. Their valuation was lower. It's a, they're a trillion dollar company. And Xbox took it. They're like, all right, we'll buy Activision. So yeah. In another, where instead of spending $70 billion on Activision Blizzard, he spent it on 230-odd games with the same budget as Spider-Man 2, perhaps Xbox is flying. What's going to happen when the next Call of Duty comes out and all that profit's going to Xbox? That's the thing. Everybody seems to be forgetting about this. That money's going to start coming back in. All the World of Warcraft money is now part of Xbox's money. All the King game money is now Xbox money. All the Bethesda game money, that's all Xbox money now. They, they did the market projections of these expenditures. 
You reported Xbox buying Activision day one, but really who cares? Activision games are turning mm -hmm. into milk system. People should avoid them. Perhaps they should, Ace, but they don't. Call of Duty is still one of the number one selling franchises in the world. And I think part of the reason that the last Call of Duty was trash was because Bobby Kotick, Kotick, I'm not going to start doing the Yang Ye Kotick thing. Bobby Kotick, I think, needed to have that release as part of the deal. That's my theory. And I hope that the future ones are a little bit better. And I, Warzone Mobile uh, came out. I played that. That was pretty fun. Like the, You're talking about games that make millions of dollars annually, like every single year. So I, I do think that they make the money back. Call of Duty is like top three of every region of the world on PlayStation. Absolutely right. But in our world, he has spent 10 years and gargantuan amounts of money taking Xbox from third place to third place. And that is not the market's fault. It is the writing. If the writing isn't on the wall for Xbox as a whole, then it certainly could be for him. Well, uh, on that note, I do think Phil is probably getting close to retiring age or wanting to retire. How old is Phil Spencer? He's 56 years old. I think this is a really good piece from Nathan Brown. He gives concrete examples of where he has seen Xbox's failure and he challenges us. I'm saying that as a fan of what Xbox has done for the industry to think about the overall picture that has been painted by Xbox. I don't think 56 is that old, but he is seven years away from being able to retire. Retirement age in the United States is like 62, usually 65. So uh, nine years at best. So what, whatever vision Phil has for the next decade, that could be it for Phil. Here in my mind is what, what Phil Spencer has done. First of all, Xbox could have already been dead with the Xbox One. It was almost killed at that point, but it didn't die. Phil Spencer took over and he said, I'm going to try and figure this out. And he has been trying to figure it out. And he has been listening to the community and interacting with the community to make positive changes for the Xbox brand. One of the first things that he did was come up with the Xbox One X, known as the Scorpio, to answer fans who were saying, hey, this thing's underpowered. Gears 5 came out at that point, and Gears 5 was phenomenal. He began working on Xbox Game Pass. He began working on the backwards compatibility library and what Xbox is able to bring to their customers. Free upgrades for all of your old games, which still holds true today to the Xbox Series X and S brand of uh, consoles. He said day and date on PC is going to be a thing. And it has been and continues to be. FBI agent asks a really good question. How do you sell next-gen Xbox with no exclusives? How do you sell a Steam Deck with no exclusives? What's, what exclusive made the Steam Deck one of the most successful handhelds to come out ever? What exclusive made it, made it successful? Because everybody, people talk about this a lot. Well, you need exclusives to be successful. You don't. You need exclusives to move consoles. I, I don't think you do especially if their next device is a handheld that has other platforms available on it. If the Xbox device comes out and it's more powerful than the Steam Deck and has Steam on it, the Epic Games Library, whatever EA has done, whatever Ubisoft has done, I do think that there is a potential for them to be successful in the handheld market. And then when they come up with their next platform, they're going to have Avowed, they're going to have whatever the sequel to Hi-Fi Rush ends up being, whatever Bethesda's Elder Scrolls, Elder Scrolls games end up being. The next Gears of War has been hinted about recently, so we will get that someday. There will be another Halo. There will be another uh, Hellblade or a game from that particular studio. There is the Bethesda game in the works that we just talked about at the top of the show. All of the Call of Duty games, while third party, could have additional incentives on the Xbox platform, like being able to play it for a, a subscription fee 
or free if you play Warzone. Phil Spencer also came up with the multiple SKU system, getting back to that for just a second, where you have the Xbox Series X and S. I do think the Series S could start to be problematic in the next few years, and they're going to have to figure out a situation where they address that challenge that developers have brought up. Features and library are the new exclusives. Absolutely. There's a bunch of studies about Gen Z and what Gen Z wants. They want to be able to play their games wherever the hell they want. Any So anybody talking about the console exclusives, console exclusives are an old idea. People want easy access. I don't want to buy a box, have to set up that box in my house, create a new account for that box, get that game, da 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 I want to turn on my phone and I want to play Call of Duty Warzone on my phone. And if I happen to have a console, I'll boot that up when I get home from work because I played and unlocked my cool reward on Call of Duty Warzone and I want to play it at home. And I I, I just, I, I really do believe that this idea of, of consoles and console exclusives, I don't think consoles are going anywhere to be very clear, but I think access is going to be a very important metric for all of these manufacturers in the years to come. I think this VGC article is great. I really appreciate Nathan Brown for making it. I don't agree with all of his points, but I think he's thought about it a lot. And what he sees as failures, I just see as positive things for the consumer. Clay wants to know, once Xbox starts putting more of their games on PlayStation 5, do you think they could launch a Game Pass Lite for PS5 without Sony blocking it? Clay, that might be a longer term play. But that's a good point. Yeah, you know, no, I, and going back to my point, people are like, are people complaining about that? No, you're right. They're not. But like this guy's saying it's a failure. How, how is it a failure that I have access to all of these games? I don't understand it. It's fantastic. So how is he, if Phil Spencer may have failed on the business side, if failures like making $200 million from a six-year-old game, as, as he talks, about, I don't agree with that assessment in, in the slightest, but if his failure has meant that I have easier access to games, I have more options about where I play my games, and I have a better overall experience with the products that I decide to uh, play on my Xbox platform, I don't see that as failure. I completely disagree with that, that ideal. So we have four games currently on PlayStation. Let's say by the end of next year, there are 10 games. By the end of 2025, there are 10 games on the PlayStation platform. PlayStation still hasn't hit their console sales target, and PlayStation needs to start looking at new rooms for growth. At that point, do you think they would like to have an Xbox Game Pass Lite service on their platform? Phil Spencer talked in the Polygon article about taking the walled garden approach and tearing it down. And I think he's onto something. I think all of the industry is taking a good, long, hard look at how games are expensive to make and how long they're taking to make and the return on that massive investment and starting to say, hey, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. And I, I think it's going to be a, a big shift. Hit that subscribe button, hit that bell if you haven't yet. A huge thank you to all the members. My members have changed. Here's the page. Uh, you can click that join button. It's usually at the bottom. I really appreciate you all. I'm going to get out of here. I'll see you for the next one. Bye for now, everybody.